We'll try to get this thing started now. My name is Chris Crawford. I'm going to be talking about creativity. Uh, two, one request, one, one uh, permission, whatever. If you want to take, if you want to take this session, that's fine by me. Um, and then a request. Uh, I, this is a very tightly prepared and rehearsed lecture. I'm going to ask you to defer any questions or interstitial comments uh, until the end when I have uh, unrolled the entire thing. So uh, I'll come apart of the scenes if, uh, if I'm interrupted in any way. So <laughs> anyway, uh, I'm going to be talking about creativity here. Creativity is pretty difficult to do. The first thing you're supposed to do in any lecture like this is define your subject matter. Problem. Creativity is magic. There's simply, it, it defies rational analysis. There's simply no way that you can take it apart into little pieces, you know, laid out like a butterfly and dissect it and so forth. You just can't do that. It remains one of those mysterious human things that we can never really define or, or analyze or anything like that. So I can't really put my hands on creativity for you. About the best I can do is sort of wave them around in the general locale of creativity. So that's what I'm going to be doing today. I'm going to be tackling the subject, approaching it from a lot of different angles, trying to give you a feeling for some of the ideas I've got on creativity. But I'm not going to be able to give you anything really hard and fast because creativity is such weird, magical stuff. I will make a point so fundamental, it should be intuitively obvious to everybody. Creativity is concerned with the invention of something new and different. Now, we'd also like to think that it's better. There is, it is possible, of course, to have bad creativity, to make something new and different that really stinks. <laughs> but let us, for the moment, set that aside. Knowing it's easy to happen, let us concern ourselves only with good creativity. The, the important point, though, here is that creativity is different. We're making something that is not the same as what has happened before. And that's so, so simple, it's dumb. But I'm going to be coming back to that point because it turns out that gets uh, lost in the wash frequently in discussions of larger issues of game design. So one of the points I want to make about creativity is that there are degrees of creativity. There's little creativity and large creativity. And I use two phrases to describe that. I, I talk about incremental creativity, and I also like to talk about grand weak creativity. Now, incremental creativity is, uh, is the easiest one to understand. You, uh, you take an existing idea, and you do it one better. And this is done quite frequently. We, uh, uh, for example, uh, uh, Richard Gary came out with Ultima. And then he decided it was such a success, he decided he'd do it better. So he did Ultima 2. I would, it is an oxymoron. And then he did Ultima 3, which is even more oxymoron. And then Ultima 4 and Ultima 5, and it's just compounding the oxymoronity here. But, uh, anyway, but the basic idea is he kept improving on it. Let's take the existing idea, do it one better. We've seen this with uh, Infocom. Uh, the, uh, this line I love to give about Infocom is a uh, variation on a quote about Vivaldi. Somebody once said, Vivaldi did not write 465 concerti. He wrote one concerto 465 times. And Infocom is the same way. They haven't done 30 or 50 different products. They've done one product 30 or 50 times over and better each time. So Infocom is engaged in lots and lots of incremental creativity. It doesn't have to be the same person, though. Many times, an idea will bounce from hand to hand, being improved each time. For example, we had Dungeons and Dragons. And then a guy in Utah decided he would do it one better by putting it on the computer. And he did something on Plato called Moria. <coughs> and then a couple other guys looked at that and said, wow, that's really neat. I think I can do that on an Apple II. And they did something called Wizardry. And then somebody else looked at that and said, hey, we can do better than that. They did Bard's Tale. And then they looked at it again and said, we can do better than that. We can do Bard's Tale too. And then they looked at it again. We can do better than that. We'll do Wasteland. And I guarantee you, someday somebody will come out with Schmeistland and you're going to do it one better. So sometimes this incremental creativity just bounces around from person to person. But the basic idea is always the same. You take an existing idea and you do it one better. Now the grand leap creativity, that's different. 
In that, what you're really doing is making a clean break with the past, starting all over, designing something completely new and different. You're, you're uh, you know, <coughs> revolutionary type stuff. And the fact is, that never happens. Pure, grand leaps just don't happen. Because everything that we do is in some way based on something that came beforehand. However, there are some products that, that have very little in connection with anything that's gone before. There are degrees here. Uh, some things that are incrementally, but you know, it's a lot of incremental. And then there are some things that are small leaps, and medium-sized leaps, and then big leaps. And the grand leap is the noble ideal that we never achieve. So what we have here is this spectrum, this scale of creativity. And the basic factor in this is, to what extent are you making a change? How different are you? The more different you are, the further you are up this scale. So, that's incremental, that's grand leap. What else can we say about it? Well, for, uh, here's a point I'd like to make about uh, these two. It should be easy. Incremental creativity <coughs> is a lot easier to do than grand leap creativity. Uh, one of, well, it's obvious that it's easy to do. I mean, all you're doing is you're taking a, an existing idea and you're making a few changes in it. An interesting point, though, that is sometimes <coughs> lost is that grand leap creativity is much, much more difficult to do than most people appreciate. A lot of people seem to think that if you make it twice as different, if you make it twice as creative, it'll be twice as hard. No way. It's four times or eight times hard. Why? You see, a game is a system, a huge system of interacting subsystems. There are all sorts of little things that go into making a game. It's like a living creature. And, and all those systems have to be in balance. If, if a system goes out of balance, the game isn't fun. There, either there's an easy way to win, hey, all you've got to do is build, uh, uh, you know, orcs. And if you've got 50 different green orcs, the orcs will win the game for you. It's a lock-on victory. It's just too easy. If a game goes out of balance, it just doesn't work. It's not fun. It's like an you know, it's like you're God and you're designing an animal and you make the heart too small and as soon as the animal gets excited, it dies of a heart attack. Uh, a game is the same way. All of these little subsystems have to fit together perfectly. Now, when you engage in incremental creativity, you take an existing system. That, that creature is there, and all you do is turn one or two knobs. You say, well, we'll increase this a little and decrease that a little. We'll give it a little more graphics, a few more monsters, a bigger vocabulary, and poof, same game. And the trick is that the, the changes that you're doing, when you turn one dial, you're throwing the system out of balance, but the only things you have to rebalance for are the interactions between that one dial and the rest of the machine. But if you're over here with a grand leap, and you've thrown in five completely new systems, and they're all interacting with each other. You got ten dials in front of you, and you turn this dial, and the whole thing goes dead. And you turn that dial, and this one, and that one, and it's hard to find a balance point that makes the whole system work. So it is immensely more difficult to do a grand leap or any type of big leap in creativity than incremental creativity. So, grand leap is real hard to do, incremental is real easy to do. Well, that would suggest the next point. Most of what most people do is incremental creativity. You look out there, the games that are on the shelves right now, the vast majority of those games are incrementally creative products. They're based on existing ideas, only they, they made it a little bit better. I would guess, I would personally guess maybe 99% of all the games out there are incrementally creative. But don't take my words for it. Take, uh, Hey, Computer Gaming Worlds here. They got August 1988 issue. What I want to do is give you a few quotes from their column, <coughs> Taking a Peek, which is a quickie review of all the games coming out. Let's just see what they say about the, the latest games that are coming out. Uh, this is a maze chase game. This is a Zaxxon type space game. Offers a familiar feel and challenge to our game. <laughs> <laughs> blah, blah, blah. It's an outer space polo or hockey game. Uh, this is a modern variation of the venerated uh, oriental strategy game of Go. Uh, let's see. An attractive Arcanines type 
game. We went to the whole class now. Arkanoids games. Uh, this is a running, jumping chase game. An espionage chase game. That's a variation on other chase games. And this product incorporates ideas from several earlier action hits. Think of Pac-Man in hyperspace. A graphic adventure in the traditional sense of parser-driven illustrated stories. The screens look like several other martial arts games. <laughs> the newest version of the famous flight simulation program. Uh, the action screens look like detailed versions of Zaxxon. This is another arcade spaceship shoot 'em up with that three-dimensional feel. This parser-driven graphic adventure and uh, the Battlefront system as refined and enhanced through the prolific sequels. <laughs> okay. I mean, it's fairly obvious here, most of the stuff coming out is incrementally creative. Is that good or is that bad? Well, let's not worry about the industry as a whole. Let's worry about you. What are you going to do? Do you want to do incremental games or grand leap games? What's better for you as a developer? Well, the right way to answer that question would be for us to do a scientific study. Why we go out there and we collect every game that's appeared in the last three, four years, and then every game we have a panel of scientific judges looking at it and say, this is 4.3 on the creativity scale, and this is 6.1, and that's 2.3, and we rate every one by its creativity, and then we look and see how many units is sold and how much money it earned for the author, and we do a big statistical plot graphic money against creativity and we get a scatter chart and we plot lines and curves through it with statistical analyses and maybe, maybe it would come out showing that the more creative you are, the more money you get. And maybe it would come out being exactly the opposite. Well, we don't know because we can't do that. First place, we can't really measure how much creativity any game has. The second place, we're really not going to get our hands on much marketing information on what's sold that well, so we can't do it the right way. So how are we going to decide this issue? Well, we haven't even come close to that, but I can give you some, some really uh, unreliable information that at least suggests whether that curve points up or down. So what I'd like to do is first look at the industries. Let's look at incremental creativity. And since I, since I said 99% of all the products out there are incremental, Let's just say that we'll look at the industry as a whole and use that as a gauge of how well incremental creativity does. That's, eh, there's some flaws in that, but eh, it'll get us into the right, get us into the right ballpark. Well, I sat down uh, with some various lists of games and a variety of other sources, and I made lists and scratches and check marks and counts, and I came up with a very rough uh, figure of merit here. Typically, in this industry, about one game in 50 becomes a hit. Now, it depends on what you call a hit. We can quibble all day. But that's, uh, that was the number I came up with. One game in 50, a 2% hit rate. Now, that's how good incremental creativity does. How are we going to gauge grand leap creativity? Well, I'm going to offer myself. <laughs> not, <laughs> not because everything I've done has been a grand leap. Because remember, you can't plan on that basis. What I can say is that throughout my career, I have consistently pursued a strategy of striving for the grand leap, which is basically the same type of decision you want to make. Do I want to try to do it? or not. And I'll tell you, some of my stuff has been leapy, and some of it has been little leaps and some medium-sized leaps. And, you know, I haven't hit every time, but uh, I have consistently worked in the direction of grand leaps. Now, how well does that work for me? Well, I've published 10 products. Two of those have been hits, Eastern Front and Balance of Power. That is a success rate of 20%. Ten times greater than the incremental strategy. Now, I grant there are a lot of ways you can quibble with this. I'll give you one quibble somebody gave when I ran this idea past me. He said, Chris, that's really unfair. I mean, after all, you're comparing yourself to the industry average. That's unfair because everybody knows that you're a talented guy. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. How do you know I've got any talent? 
Do you have any hard evidence that I had any talent whatsoever? The only evidence you have is my success rate. Don't hold that against me. Don't use it to, to you know, invalidate my results. What I'm saying is this is one of the things that I've been working at, and it seems to be one of the factors that's worked for me. Maybe it could work for you, too. So, so uh, this, the, uh, and especially, especially when we get this huge difference that we were talking about, 20% better, well, we could bury that in statistical uncertainty, but an order of magnitude? I mean, if I came to you and offered you a computer that was 10 times faster than the machine you were now using, would you, would you be interested? So this, this grand leap strategy seems to be far more successful. But there's another problem here. This runs counter to the industry wisdom. I mean, everybody knows that grand leap, that's risky stuff, being creative. Boy, you can fail. That's, that's dangerous. In mental creativity, that's safe and secure. And you're always, I mean, if you do Schneeslang, you're guaranteed to sell 10, 20,000 units easily. You do a great job, you sell a lot more than that. So, so geez, uh, the industry wisdom doesn't support this. Wait a minute. What is the industry wisdom? Most of what people call industry wisdom is really publisher wisdom. And you are not a publisher. Let me give you the best example of this. I like to talk about a product called Chuck Yeager's Advanced Flight Trainer. Now here's a product that's uh, quite successful. I've never played it, which is why I picked it, so I, can, I can't accept the blame for the uh, uh, observations I'm about to make on it. But <laughs> quite a few people, well, I should say a number of people who are knowledgeable, whose opinions I respect, have told me their assessments of the product, which is that it is a very competently executed flight simulator and it is utterly uncreative. That is, there is not a single new idea in that product. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> that is, they took the best ideas of other existing flight simulators, they put, them to, they put them together very, very well, they came up with the hottest, sexiest, sanest flight simulator on the market. And then, that EA marketing mega machine swings into action. We're going to get ourselves the sexiest license we can. And they went out and they got Chuck Yeager. That's a license. And then they made themselves their Chuck Yeager stand-up posters with Chuck Yeager with his white helmet. And their Chuck Yeager, Chuck Yeager posters he stick on the wall. And the Chuck Yeager audio tapes. And the Chuck Yeager chopskis. And Chuck Yeager everything. And they marketed the big jabbers out of that product. And they sold zillions of them. It's fantastic. It was an immensely successful product. So here I am telling you, hey, you've got to be creative, and yet you've got a beautiful counterexample in Chuck Yeager's advanced uh, flight trader. Why do you need to be creative when you can get filthy rich? <laughs> <laughs> There's a catch. You are not a publisher. You don't control any of that marketing. It's not your decision to get Chuck Yeager. It's not your decision to turn that EA marketing mega machine loose on your product. You don't have any control over that. And yeah, yeah, if uh, Trip Hawkins comes fluttering down from heaven and says, <laughs> <laughs> of what you control. You've got to use the angles that you've got, and you don't have any control over those marketing issues. So they are utterly irrelevant to your considerations as a developer. They simply should not enter into your decision-making process. You've got to use your basis of competitive advantage, and your creativity is your best basis of competitive advantage. Go with that. So there's a very strong reason for you to push hard up into that grand leap creativity. So 
let's assume that you're sold. You're, you're sitting there saying, Hallelujah! I got religion! <laughs> Praise the Lord! I'm going to be creative! Good for you, brother. <laughs> How are you going to do it? How are you going to get creative? Well, I can give you some rules of thumb here. Some, some guidelines, but they're real <coughs> loose and sloppy. So let me give you what I can here. First, I'll give you a couple negative rules, some don'ts. First, don't. Do not be seduced by technology. That's putting the cart before the horse. Remember the root, the Greek root of the word technology <coughs> very roughly translates as know-how. The how of doing something always comes second. I mean, if you want to accomplish something in this world, the first step is to decide what you want to accomplish. The second step is to decide how you're going to do it. This is basic common sense. And yet we see people who get seduced by the technology and they spend all their time figuring out all the neat things they could do if only they knew what they wanted to do. Examples, all the people who got excited over the Amiga. Great machine, really sexy, but should you learn the machine and then try to figure out what you want to do with it? That's kind of backwards. CD-ROM is a similar, te uh, similar example. Very sexy technology, very powerful, but if you don't know what you want to do first, you're wasting your time. We see the same thing with software technologies, fractals. A lot of people got real excited because fractals are so sexy. So they put together some fractal demo, and then they say, gosh, how can we turn this into a game? A, an even worse example, 3D graphics technology. So we see this all the time. Somebody comes up with a sexy way to do 3D graphics on a machine with hidden surface removal, and so many frames per second, so many polygons per second. They, do a, they, they get real excited over it, it's great technology, they get the technology working, and then at the last minute they say, how can we make this into a game? <laughs> this is idiocy. It's backwards. If you want to accomplish something, decide what you want to do, then decide how you're going to do it. Get your priorities straight. If you've got reverse priorities, that technological seduction will destroy the creative process. Another negative rule. Do not allow marketing, do not internalize <coughs> marketing thinking. Do not allow marketing thinking to intrude on the creative process. This is, this is a mistake commonly made by developers who try really hard to get along with their publishers, trying to see things the way the publisher does, or trying to, trying to be a good businessman, so I'm going to think hard about the marketing side of all of this. And it is good to think about the marketing <coughs> side, but we're talking about the creative issues right now. Now, the, the publishers, they rely exclusively on the marketing issues. They look at those focus group results, they look at the sales figures, they look at what's selling well. They rely very, very heavily on the marketing results. And that is as it should be because that's all they've got to work with. And it's not their job to be creative. It's your job to be creative. Marketing is fundamental. Marketing thinking is fundamentally inimical to creativity. There is a fun, it is fundamentally antithetical. Why? Well, the whole strategy of marketing thinking is we're going to take what we know about the past. We're going to take our sales figures, whatever focus group results. We're going to take what we know about what sold well yesterday, and we we're going to do that tomorrow. The basic idea then is we're going to, you know, if red games sold well yesterday, we're going to sell red games tomorrow. And if purple dinosaur games sold well yesterday, let's do a purple dinosaur. The fundamental notion here is similarity. Let's do the same thing tomorrow that sold well yesterday. The fundamental notion of creativity is dissimilarity. In other words, marketing thinking is fundamentally antithetical to creative thinking. Now, I'm not saying that you should reject marketing thinking. Marketing thinking must go into consideration if you want to sell product. Marketing thinking is something you must compromise with, not something you must internalize. Don't allow it to intrude into your creative process. It is inimical to creativity. Okay, there's some negative rules. How about some positive ones here? That eh, gets a little harder here. One suggestion. Live in the world of ideas. 
ideas, see, creativity, when you create a new idea, you don't just pull an idea out of a black vacuum. All new ideas come from relationships and associations with other ideas. Ideas are the raw material of creativity. And so you want to stoke yourself up with lots of ideas. You want to be thinking in, in terms of lots of different ways of thinking, lots of different ideas. You need to fill yourself up with all of those ideas. And this is a problem for people in our industry because too many people in our industry are too narrowly educated. They are primarily technical in orientation and they insist on remaining technical. There's nothing wrong with having a technical background. It's when you, when you put walls around yourself and you say, that's all I'm going to be. When you go home and the only books in your library are technical manuals. Uh, the, the very best designers, this is a very clear cut relationship, the best designers that I know have, have enormous intellectual curiosity. Talk to Dan Button sometime about psychology. Uh, these people, nothing can stop them. They're, they're voracious. They're soaking up all the ideas they can. And that's one main source of their creativity. Ideas are the fodder of creation. So you need to expose yourself to lots of different ideas. How do you do this? One way. Talk to a lot of different people with very different points of view, not just technical people. You know, have you ever, have you ever had a conversation with Brenda Wall? And she thinks different. She talks different. She's talking about this guy named Harry Stottle. I've never met Harry, but I'd sure like to someday, because he sounds like an interesting fellow. Uh, you know, she, and, and you have to work hard, you have to think, you really have to, to work to keep up with Brenda, because she thinks so differently, and it's so illuminating. Brenda, you really ought to, uh, you know, start a consulting business where you go around and charge people $100 an hour to talk weird at It's so thought-provoking. I thought she did so, that. And you need <laughs> Techno You really need to encounter lots of different people with very different <coughs> points of view. That's one way to live in the world of ideas. Another way, read books, lots of books, books on different subjects. If all you're reading are science fiction paperbacks, you're in trouble. You've got to be reading books about, about history and genetics and physics and philosophy and <coughs> linguistics and, and sociology and psychology and military history. And, and all the things that make this such a huge and fascinating world, you've got to immerse yourself in all of those ideas. You'll never, ever come close to, to scratching the surface, but, but you've got to make that effort because that is a major source of creative uh, power or something like that. Okay, another idea on uh, getting creative. This is this is really difficult. You've got to develop an appreciation, a respect for the psychology of the creative process. And to, to illustrate this, this is such a difficult point. I'd like to draw a very uh, strange metaphor here. I'd like to say that the human psyche is like a whip. Now, you know how a whip works? Uh, <laughs> this is another one of those ideas from the world of ideas. A whip is thick at one end, and it's thin at the other end. And the idea is you wiggle. You start at this end of the whip and you wiggle it. You put a wave into the whip and the wave starts traveling down the whip. Now the wave has a constant amount of energy that doesn't go away. But as it travels down the whip, that the whip gets smaller and smaller and there's less and less mass to transmit the energy of the wave. So there's more and more energy per unit mass and so the whip has to travel faster and faster to transmit that energy. And so by the time the, the, the wave reaches the tip of the whip, there's only a tiny amount of mass, and it has to move very, very fast to transmit that energy. And it, in fact, it goes so fast that it breaks the speed of sound, and the whip cracks. Now, the human psyche, if you'll forgive some uh, poetic excess here, the human psyche is sort of like a whip. That is, down at this end, we have conscious, rational intellect, the type of thinking we do when we write a computer program, for example. Moving further up the whip and you get into uh, conscious non-rational thinking. The type of thinking you do when you're uh, thinking real fast and you couldn't actually write it down what you're thinking down on a piece of paper but you're still thinking. 
any movement further up and you get into conscious feelings. The, the emotions you have, the feelings you have that you know you have. A little further up, you get into subconscious emotion. The feelings you have that you don't know you have. And then at the end of the web yeah. are the deepest, murkiest, most <laughs> instinctive types of human Mark. mental activity. Mark. Now, creativity is uh, sort of like a wave traveling down with it. It really starts down here at the instinctive end of the psyche, and it travels down the whip. But there's a problem. You see, most of us live somewhere around here. Most of us, what we call me, is this guy here, and we're not even really aware of all of this. <clears throat> the real problem is some people refuse to acknowledge this part of their psyche. And so those creative impulses come traveling down the whip, and these people block the impulses. They stop it from going down. They try to consciously control the creative process. These poor fools go through life accomplishing <laughs> nothing. It's a waste. It's a shame. Because it's a waste of human talent. A waste of human uh, potential. If you would be creative, Engage your entire psyche. You must be aware of the instinctive side of your psyche. Carl Jung once wrote, One of the most difficult tasks that men can perform, however much others may despise it, is the invention of good games. And it cannot be done by men out of touch with their instinctive selves. That's what you have to do. Have to develop that awareness of your instinctive self, but I can give you no further advice on that topic. I can give you some <laughs> some other guidelines on how to help the creative process along. Step one. First, identify the problem. Make sure you at least know what you're trying to fix here. Take the time to identify the creative issue that's killing you. Second step, communicate that problem throughout your entire mind. Do you really think that by merely thinking about a problem, you have communicated it through your entire mind? The human mind is vastly more complex than that. If you want to really bring your, uh, bring your entire psyche to bear, you've got to communicate it to your entire psyche. So, so walk around and talk about the problem. Say the words out loud. Discuss all of the variations and the possible solutions and the things about the problem that bother you. Say the words out loud. Why? Because your ears will hear the words. And the problems, the, the, the issues will enter your mind through the auditory channels. That's a different uh, vehicle of communication, a different area of processing. And you'll bring more of your mind to bear. Don't just do that. Draw pictures of the problem. Lots of pictures. Give it as many visual representations as you can. Draw, draw many, many different variations of pictures. And look at the pictures. Why? Because then your eyes will see the problem. And the problem will enter your mind through the visual cortex. That's a different realm of processing, a different section of your mind. And more of your mind will come to bear on it. If possible, try to somehow express the problem in tactile terms. Feel what it's like in your skin. Roll around on the floor wrestling with it. I've done that. It helps because you're communicating the problem to other areas of your mind. Once you've done that, you're ready for the killer step. And this one, uh, this one is tough. You have to drive that problem far up the whip. You're here, you've got to push that problem as far up this whip as you can. How do you do that? You've got to feel the problem. Remember, emotion is the coin of the realm in the human mind, and if you're not willing to pay the price, you won't get the goods. That is a problem, and so when you feel it, it doesn't feel good, it hurts. It's a problem, and you've got to feel that hurt. Have you ever, have you ever heard the term creative agony? Do you know what that phrase means? Have you ever really felt creative agony? If you haven't, you have not created because creative agony is not some sideline of creativity. It is an essential component of the creative process. 
creative agony is what drives the problem deep, deep down into your psyche. Creative agony is what creates that push, what drives it up the whip, pushes it far up into the, into the deeper areas of your psyche. You've got to have that creative agony. You've got to go on long walks and scream at the sky, but the balance is wrong! <laughs> if you can't do that, you won't be creative. It's that simple. It's hard. It hurts. But you've got to do it. It's a fundamental step in the creative process. And when you've done that, when you've felt it enough, when it's hurt enough, when you've driven it deep enough, then do nothing. Rest. Sleep in the arms of the dragon. <laughs> you must allow it to simmer by itself. You've got to back off from it and let it take care of itself. How long will it take? Weeks? Months? There's no way of knowing. You simply have to wait. You cannot control this process. You are a puppet on a string. You are not living at the handle of the whip, but far up the whip. And you just have to wait for it to act of itself. The answer will come someday when it's ready. The human psyche does not operate on a dead run, which raises a problem. <laughs> Publishers, too. <laughs> How are you going to solve that? Well, there is something you can do to at least help. Organize your project so that the picky, mindless programming, all of that stuff that you do on Valium, comes at the end. <laughs> you know, things like loading and saving the game, and throwing up a title screen, and an end game, and all of those things that are busy work, housekeeping type programming. Segregate all of that stuff to the latter portion of your project so that in the early phases you're working on tough creative <coughs> issues and in the later stages you, you call, cross a transition point where you say, well, from here on in I'm just coasting. No more real creative work. From here on in it's just programming work. If you've scheduled it right, you should have at least three months, maybe even six months of this, of this mindless programming phase. That is when you begin the creative work on your <coughs> next project. That allows you to go through all the creative agony. And I can assure you, creative work and programming work are two completely <coughs> different things. You just don't have, you're not going to have any interference between the two. So keep your mind fully occupied. Work on the creative issues of project B while you're resolving the final technical issues of project A. That at least will help you with that scheduling. <coughs> A final comment on creativity. Creativity, it should be obvious by now, is not fun. You don't sit around in front of the keyboard giggling and say, Oh, wow, look at that, isn't it fun? It doesn't work that way at all. It's hard. It, it makes demands on your emotional resources that you may not be willing to give. It, it's draining. It hurts. It's, it's killing. Why should you put yourself through all of that? What's the point of driving yourself to this emotional breaking point? Well, I can tell you I've, I've done it a lot of times, and yet it's caused a lot of pain. But when I finish a project, and maybe a few months after, after I've allowed it to rest and the wounds have healed, and I can look at that thing, hold it in my hands, and realize I have created beauty. I have brought something into the world that is good and true and beautiful. There is a feeling of, of profound satisfaction that comes from that. The earth moves. It's, it is, I, I cannot describe the feeling, but I can tell you, after having done it many times, it's worth it.
Yeah, that is a problem. I mean, you can't call up the publisher and say, I'm sorry, I'm not going to make the deadline. My psyche is so uh, sorry, not much I can do there. Yes, I Side of my job is far less demanding than the creative yeah. side of my yeah. job. Well, so, and I'm not saying that all programming is mindless, I'm saying that there are types of programming that are mindless. Setting up a load and save is a very good example of, oh God, we've got to get all the variables in one place and ship them out. And how does that damn file manager system work? And that, that's mindless stuff. You, it takes a few days. That, that's not the point. Yes? Chris, why don't you work with other programmers? Uh, <clears throat> Because I'm an asshole. <laughs> there are a lot of people who can attest to that. I'm hard to work with. I'm very demanding, and I, I kick and I push. I'm hard on myself, and I'm, I'm hard on other people. And I've had people work for me, and I feel bad about what I did to them. And I don't think I want to do that to anybody else. Uh, and every, every now and then I say, well, I'm going to try to work with somebody. And then I start getting excited. You got that pull. I didn't expect that. Wait a minute. Let's be even. Go away. <laughs> yes. Uh, I agree with your what you've been saying in spirit, but let me throw a devil's advocate at you. Sure. Um, how many people in their life can say they're going to always reach that far and, and be able to always make something new? What happens if you like what you found? Let's say you do reach out for something or you find a niche. Yeah. You you may you poked on an Ultima. Well he found a niche. Yeah. And he liked that niche and so he continued it. I mean one person might say he's incrementally being creative, another person might say he loves it. I Four mean, times? Uh, I don't know. Uh, I don't uh, agree with that. Five, yeah. But you know, uh, look how many play Shakespeare wrote. And a lot of people would say that his basic format is the same for all of them, but yet he filled his whole life with those things. Cer certainly there is a role for developing an idea. For example, I intend to come back and do trust and betrayal right someday. <laughs> you get an idea, you develop it. And maybe the first time it doesn't work right, okay, I can see coming back and let's take another stab at this, let's get it right this time. And, well, okay, maybe try a third time. But I would say, if I did a success, then I would say it's time to walk away from that. I've, I was really reluctant to do Patton versus Rama because my feeling was, I've already done a good war game. Why do I want to go back and do another one? Just, just to belabor the point, just because you do, let's say it's film, let's say, just because you direct one mystery film doesn't mean you can't ever direct one again. I don't, know, I don't know. I just think genres are important. I don't think you should always have to say you have to jump out of your genre. Perhaps. Perhaps. It, it's a debatable. I think. I can see the case. Yes? Yeah, I, I, I sort of was starting to think along the, the same line. Sometimes grand leaps don't occur uh, from product to product. It's a mistake to think of the disc as, as the particular focal point of any uh, creative leap, but it may emerge over over long periods of time. That, you, know, you may have an itch, and you may not know where to scratch it until the fourth time you count that you've done it. Um, and that uh, one other thing, and that has to do with the, the dread M word of marketing. Now, what marketing is versus how it's actually practiced today are two different things. Yes. <laughs> and that, that we're approaching points in the evolution of the PC industry, I think, where doing the same thing over and over again is going to be disaster. And that it's going to be the risk takers to yeah. market. Yeah. That's going to be something. Okay. Way back. Uh, just to finish your thought on your original. Uh, metric of, of success rate, uh, you, got, you have to remember that Ultima's got 100% success rate so far. Mm -hmm. So on that basis, uh, yeah. maybe his decision to, to follow up is not so bad. Yes, uh, yes, that is a good point. Uh, on the sa at the same time, there's, I mean, in our own pro uh, series of games, we've, I think, recognized as, as a leap forward with Deja Vu, and have then tried to follow it up to take the same game system into other areas that we weren't able to do the first time, while starting to do a whole other game system to take us another leap forward in, in a different direction. In fact, oh, simultaneously. So in fact, you can I, do can both. Uh, I can see a real good rationale if you do something like uh, Deja Vu is an excellent example. You make a huge investment in a grand leap, 
and you're never going to get a fair return on that investment, so maybe you need to do some sequels to, to earn enough money out on your research. So yeah, that makes economic sense. Uh, I had the luxury in this lecture of confining myself primarily to creative issues. I still think that grand leap creativity is a good way to make money. I recognize that there are all sorts of interesting strategies that allow you to make lots of money without being that creative. Uh, but just to amplify your creative process, though, uh, the three people that created the game system first spent almost nine months basically secluded in a room yelling at each other. Uh, I mean, major anger, uh, people running out the door screaming, you're, such, you're an incredible asshole, I'll never talk to you again. And that agony did, I mean, it was exactly that, creative agony for a long period of time before the game system came out of it. Yeah. Um, you know, you made a comment that technology shouldn't be our game, that's absolutely true. But I would contend that a lot of great things have happened because of technical things, such as wouldn't nice have a game that changed climates and the work pieces of the industry? It wasn't really doable on the cover of the tech and tactics, but it was definitely doable when the economy came around. And Blue the Dice of the Game with beautiful artwork, and blue high sounds, and music would be possible on the Amiga with Friends of the Crowd, which was a great game. Uh, it wouldn't have been possible on the uh, CGA uh, on the NPC. And the same way, once again, wouldn't be great if we had a game where you could go all over the place. And that would be really an easy to do like Hypercar. And Hypercar would be the man that was uh, the man holding. Our points are completely compatible. That is, I'm not saying that you want to reject technology and say, ah, who on technology? Uh, what I'm arguing is, don't allow the technology to drive the creative process. I didn't well, allow the 800 to decide what I was going to do with these two fronts. Well, new technology will often spark a new creative idea. You can't. I hope not. I hope that the well, spark I mean, comes from a designer who then looks at the technology and says, here's how I can do that. Well, if you were considered doing that, it wasn't totally Role. True, true. But that was not my primary intent. No, of course not. So that was a means to an end, not an end in itself. That's the fundamental distinction. Yes? Uh, on the issue of genres, I think uh, we have to view genres in our business somewhat differently than established business like books, where you can say, Mickey's the lane, he's just grinding out the same books again and again. I think kind of spectrum of little creators needs some big ones. I think uh, it's very valid to Exciting, it's Hollywood type stuff, but if you look at the total distance, here's where we were back in 1975, and here's where we stand today, and we look at the distance we have covered, I would argue that the bulk of the actual movement has been made by incremental creativity. The grand, why? Because there are so many hundreds of people taking these little tiny steps, and there are only a few people taking the grand leaps, but the few people are so completely outnumbered by the many that the incremental creativity is responsible for more progress in, in aggregate than the Grand Leap. Yes? Oh, just like, I, I think what you're doing in uh, exhorting people to take the Grand Leap is very admirable and I, I'm glad you're doing it, but I also think that you're introducing some sort of dangerous stuff uh, just from the sense of trying to make a living doing it as well, in that specifically your points about uh, you know Trip Hawkins coming down and saying you know I have chosen you you know at random and your your point you have no say over what the companies are going to put their muscle behind. Uh, as much as I agree with you that they're very conservative and that they're always many most of the companies are spending most of their money uh, saying I want a slightly improved version of the last hit. Uh, and I think that that's a dangerous way for the industry to go. 
if you want to make some money on a game, or particularly if you want to sell it to a publisher, if you come to a publisher and say, here's a new simulation, it's a lot like you know, X, but I have 50% uh, you know, higher frame rate and eight more colors on the screen, and uh, they, they may say, um, you know, it, it may turn out that, that isn't really advancing the state of the industry, but they're much more likely to say, great, we're going to market the hell out of it because it's just like you know, Chuck Yeager. Or for that matter, Chuck Yeager is like uh, Flight Simulator 2, which has been incredibly successful, but it's obviously better. And just for the folks here who need to sell to the publisher and try and get the publisher to put some, some force behind it, it's not completely arbitrary. Unfortunately, but true, if you give them something they can understand, they're much more likely to push it. You're right. And in fact, the excellent best example of that is the, the tra trail of tears I followed trying to convince publishers to buy Balance of Power. And nobody did. And so your wisdom is right. I shouldn't have done Balance of Power and sold all, those, uh, all of those units. Yeah, but so. what about all the people that have gone and said, here's some great new game that's completely different, and they've, they didn't get it sold, and now they're right. off doing insurance programs. A lot of creativity fails. <laughs> that's absolutely right. It's just that if you want, if you can find yourself, if you're going to put those blinders on yourself and say, well, I'm playing it safe, I'm going to do incremental creativity, yes, you'll, you'll make some money every year, and that's about all that will ever happen to you. Unless Trip Hawkins flutters down from heaven. <laughs> So, if you want to take control of your life and accomplish something, if you have high goals for yourself, you're not going to accomplish them with incremental creativity. Period. Carol. I'd like to make a point on behalf of the partnership. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm real serious about this. Um, some of us really like to take chances on brand new creative stuff. We really want to be misplaced and we really want to be innovative. And in fact, the products that we reject that come in the door are those products that look just exactly like all the other ones. The ones that are too familiar, that look just like everything else, we're not interested in. And I don't know whether developers realize the extent to which we depend on you to help us define what will differentiate your product in the marketplace, but what will help it sell, what it is, that's going to hook the user into buying your special creative product. And so what I would say to you is that you know, when I evaluate a new product that comes in the door, what I want is the thing that is absolutely different. And what I need from you is what Brian Moriarty said in the last session. What I need from you is to help me sell our marketing department on what it is that will make the user buy your product. So I just hope that Phil will think about that. Yes? How many failures did you get before you first Uh I've done ten games, two were hits. Well, in fact, let me give you more detail right down. Ten games, four were, in my view, grand leaps. Those were Eastern Front, uh, Balance of Power, Trust and Betrayal, and Excalibur. Of those four grand leaps, Eastern Front and Balance of Power were hits. Excalibur will never really know. It was never really marketed, so it's a question mark. Trust and Betrayal was a failure. Okay? I did two games where I explicitly pandered to the marketing wisdom. I'm going to sell what you know, the marketing people say. This is what's going to sell. Hey, I failed a couple of times. Let's be humble. Let's do what they say. Those two games were Patton vs. Ronald and Legionnaire. Neither of them failed. They both sold some units. Neither of them made enough money to, to pay you know pay my, my for my time, and neither one of which neither one of them do I want on my tombstone. <laughs> Wait, this question was, how many did you do before your first hit? Right? Oh, before my first hit, I did Tanktix, Scram, Energy Czar, and then Eastern Front. Three, and uh, Tanktix, Scram, and Energy Czar. No, no. Successful. I mean, not a little real uh, Each one had, had its, it was a moderate size. Jeff. What was your source of income at the time? Ah, I was an employee. I was getting a salary. I could afford to take risks. <laughs> In fact, the trick with Eastern Front was I got so a tarp. One of my you may have noticed if you if you got a great deal of perception here that I may have some possibly negative feelings about marketing. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that, that stems from my days, in the early days of Atari, where Atari had staffed up to a zillion people and hired all these marketing people.
from other fields, and everyone was scratching their heads saying, how do you market home computer stuff? And nobody knew. And, and there were just all these wild opinions about, oh, do it this way. Oh, what we need is a, uh, is a program that allows a, lady, a little lady to move the furniture around her house on the computer and uh, see what the furniture will look like. All these weird, crazy ideas. It was nonsense. It was crazy. And I got so disgusted with all this marketing crap going on that I said, God damn it, I don't care if I never sell a game. I'm going to do a game for me the way I want to do it, a game that I think is fun, and I don't care if nobody ever buys it. And that was Eastern Fun. <laughs> That's why I have such strong feelings here. Uh, the one time I really just, you know, just said, go, is, is, was one of my greatest successes. And that's a, a, a data point, one data point, and I'm drawing a, a line. <laughs> I'd, I'd like to hear from you and other people in the audience on the influence of collaboration on the creative process versus kind of doing it solo and being a czar of the creative process. Uh, I, I can't talk about collaboration because I've done it so poorly. The only attempt I made was Excalibur. Actually, that project was, I feel, creatively successful. It was very difficult, and I think the only reason it had any success was that the collaboration took roughly the form of the dictator. I, I remember walking in with a button that said, no more hate Mr. Nice Guy. And, and these people were ready to quit before I wore the button. So, uh, I don't know. I, I, I can bring nothing to bear on the issue of collaboration. Uh, Dan Button would actually be. Dan, are you here? Uh, I can address that a yeah, bit from, sure. from Deja Vu. Uh, one of the rules, which was pretty strange, from the three guys, it was a troika, three guys have to be a real good number for, for even-handed collaborations with no dictator. Uh, the, the rule was basically, if the two people that thought it should go one way couldn't to convince the third person, then it generally went the other way. Uh, that is, <laughs> the, the one guy who had a real strong opinion and, and was successfully able to defend it, usually one out over the other two uh, in, in, a per, in a protracted discussion. The other thing is be, pre be prepared to not like a person for a while. Uh, I mean, you, by the time everything's said and done, you'll probably be real friendly with them because, it's, because you'll have this group satisfaction of having created a really neat thing, but uh, discussions get real heated. You're going to have to be ready to yell, scream, and kick uh, because that's the only way people can communicate with each other. Uh, forcibly, I mean, you have to be very strong about your, your, your feelings when you're trying to get an idea across, uh, and it can be real painful, but that's part of the creative process, and it does work. And I think you get, you can get a better product that way uh, sometimes than doing it alone because you've got three people's ideas rather than one. Uh, on the other hand, you do tend to have a, a committee problem sometimes, so, which is why the one person winning out over two helps a lot. Yeah, I've collaborated on everything I've done. And I completely agree with what sounds like backward logic, which is that the odd man out wins. Every concept has to be owned. Everything you do, someone has yeah. to believe in to the death. If you take this sort of, well, you know, this is sort of the general consensus. All of you just back off and let it go. And it's on its own. And it's not going to have to have life. No one is going to mother that idea or that technique to, to where it really needs to be. And if you're in collaboration, absolutely, you have got to love the violence that and fight for them, and absolutely die for them. And, you know, absolutely. Not, not to sort of go, we'll vote on it. Jerk. Well, I'd like to just say briefly that I do agree in essence to that, but I don't necessarily think that's true. Because I've, uh, I've worked with a lot of different people, and uh, that does happen when you get a committee and no, people don't agree. But I've also had a lot of good times creating products with people and if you have confidence with what people are doing in their unique fields I'm an artist I work with other engineers game designers some marketing people uh, I I've had my problems but I've also have had some good products come out of it so I don't necessarily think that you have to oh, good. come good. to the point where you're gonna strangle somebody <laughs> necessarily no, no, not to say it doesn't happen but I'm just saying that there is the other side of it as well. There'll be some times when the synergy just sweeps you away. I mean, when all three people are clicking in the same cylinder and things just happen in a wonderful way. <coughs> well, just maybe those are the times I remember more. Yeah. <laughs> we have run out of time. Thank you.